All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode six of Turmoil and Taldore. It's a quick recap of last session. Our adventurers had been traveling on the road from the Emerald Outpost to Iman. Um, have a quick errand, in which case they needed to do in the city, and then they are kind of essentially free to explore or do whatever they need. Um, as they had been traveling, they got caught in the middle of a blizzard, had to make camp. After making camp, they had encountered a couple of travelers as well. Um, the travelers had stated that they had encountered a giant that had destroyed their camp and was just simply looking for a place to rest for the night, and then they were going to head off on their own. The party decided to investigate the camp and ended up getting into a fight with a rather strange frost giant. Um, strange, whereas they were fighting, it had weird runes marked on its body and writing an infernal that they were able to decipher some of it, but not everything. Um, talking it up as a bizarre encounter, they ended up going back to their camp, resting, and then making their way into the city. And that is where we pick us up today. As you guys are traveling down the road, um, you start to see the walls of Iman. Grand white marbling. Uh, the walls themselves are probably about 30 feet high. They encircle the city. Um, you do hear the sounds of people and civilization. Uh, definitely a lot more of a general ruckus of people than you guys have been accustomed to over the past month dealing with the Emerald Outpost. There are people that seem to be um, hawking their wares and trading on the outside of the city. You do see some farmlands that are not in operation right now because of the winter. Um, a kind of shanty town almost outside of the, the walls that encompasses the lower slums of the mob. You guys approach the gates, and as you get closer to the city, you not only hear the, the din of humanoid life, but the sounds of seagulls, the cold smell of salty water from the Osmic Sea. And you approach what is to be a very grand expanse. As you come into the city, and I'll go ahead and toss the map of Iman up here. Before we enter the city, uh, Zero will turn to the party and go, are we going to talk about the name before we go in there? to talk about it outside of the city? Or would we rather talk about it in the comfort of an inn? I mean... Uh, it is rather sure. cold out here, and some of us are wearing metal <laughs> on our bodies. I guess we could talk about it in, like, a tavern. Somewhere warm. Okay. Just as she says that, a cold breeze comes off of the ocean. <laughs> Dips everybody's cloaks. And while, as you guys are heading north to the city, it is still cold. It's not as bitter as it was closer to the mountains. Um, there's definitely a difference of about maybe 20 degrees. Um, Still snow on the ground, still probably in the, the 20s now, but much different than the, like, zeros you guys were at on the road up here. Uh, 
as you can see on the map, you guys came up through the lower slums and to the gate heading into the central district. Now, you were again greeted with the din of life. Um, as you look around, Iman is known kind of as like the jewel of the human empires. Um, while you do see a mix of different races here, elves, dwarves, uh, stray tiefling or halfling, um, it is primarily humans that you do see walking the streets. The city, as you come in through the large expanse of gate, is set up in tiers up on the hill. The lower levels that you're in seems to encompass the main primary section of the city and does wrap around in a circle, if you would. As you look to the, the next tier of that, you do see another section of the wall that closes off a part of the city, and then again another section of wall that leads up to the castle. Now, the castle itself had once stood as the pinnacle of human uh, creation in regards to buildings. It still has not fully recovered since the attack on it 20 years ago. Part of the castle is still collapsed and in ruins. Um, seems that the city and its struggle to recover focused more on fixing everything else but the actual castle itself. Um, the walls, there are definitely sections of the walls that seem newer than the rest. Um, some sections of the walls that don't even look like masonry look like they've actually been magically constructed or raised up and put together compared to worked by hand. Um, it has this sense of strange uniformity to it but it also has these spots where somebody actually labored in it, and you can see the difference between that perfect stonework that's crafted by transmutation compared to those that are managed by hand. The central district is largely that of the... Um, Getting everything pulled up here real quick. Um, Central District is largely the residential district. So you see less shops, and you do see a couple shops here and there, or a couple um, smaller restaurants or taverns. Um, this is largely set with homes. Um, and while there are spots of the, the homes that seem to be in general disrepair, um, largely, this is fairly decent homes, largely wood and stone construction, um, but homes are taken care of in this section of the city. Um, you do see the guard of Amon walking through the streets. Um, they don't, unlike where you guys first got to the Emerald Outpost, you're not seeing guards hassling people in regards to um, you know, protection money or anything like that. The proper city guards, some saying hi and good morning, others just going about their day. So, with you guys now making it into the city, what is it that you would want to do? Where, what direction? Um, I will say that it's late morning, probably around like 11-ish to 12-ish. <laughs> Clearly, we need to get something to eat. Sounds like a sound plan from uh, from Zerelda there. I would agree with this. Okay. Somebody want to take point and try to track the place down? I mean, would Zero know which way to go? Probably been here more than once. 
Um, give me a history check. Okay. Uh, uh, dirty twenty. Okay. Um, you definitely Woo. have uh, run into a couple places here. Um, I've definitely heard stories. Um, you have a general overview on like what each of the sections of city are for. Um, as you decide to take point on this, um, you do know of a pretty decent little like mom and pop restaurant that will actually be let me get this clarified here that will actually be in Abdar's promenade um probably one did of the zero sorry go ahead did zero actually say anything that she was going to take point because um, uh, I was going to turn to uh, Zeno because I know that he hails from Iman. I was going to ask him where the best eats are. I mean, or did Zero already take point. I could just make a suggestion. You guys can go from there. Zeno. Like, oh, sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Take your <laughs> kind of this look of like, uh, I was just gonna go to my favorite diner, but you know, if you want to go somewhere, sure. That's like no, we can go to your place. I was yeah. just suggesting. I would, uh, I would trust the man that uh, hails from Iman. No offense, little zero, but uh. Surely he's been around the city. He knows the most delectable uh, diners. So I say we follow Zeno. Okay. Give his favorite diner a little, uh, uh, little extra business this day. All right. So then our. The, uh, the place that you're familiar with, then, um, that will actually be, uh, that will also be in Abdar's Promenade. It's actually not too far away from your office, um, only just a couple blocks away from it. Um, you're familiar with it as Wiffle's Waffles. Please tell me it's like a dive bar. I mean, you can look for a dive bar if you'd like. Wiffles Waffles. No, I'm is... saying like Wiffles Waffles sounds like like that weird kind of like hole in the wall place, but like you go inside and it's like really nice and inviting and super good. Oh, it definitely is. Um, I mean, Wiffle... I would expect nothing else from where Zeno, <laughs> where his favorite restaurant is. Wiffles Waffles is uh, a little establishment that is run by the Wiffle family, you know, a pair of gnomes. And they make the largest waffles that you've ever had in your life. How large? Uh, imagine the biggest waffle you've ever had. Times two. No, it's not big enough. <laughs> and gnomes How? Uh, typically are pretty friendly I say uh, let's go alright so with Zeno taking point um, you guys make it through the streets easy enough and after probably about maybe a half hour of walking um, you do eventually head to Wiffle's Waffles. The establishment is a red brick building. Um, it definitely is busy in there. Um, you do see a lot of people that are in there, but there are still tables open. Um, you see 
large, wide windows, Twiffles waffles printed on the sides and what looks to be some form of powdered sugar. Um, the place while being exactly as he described, wonderful, inviting, does have a level of lived in uh, because there are definitely places where there is just flour on the walls. Um, it looks like it's been kept up to the best of the ability, but you know, somebody watches, you know, flower up the ceiling and that's outside of their reach. Guys go in the the welcome welcoming ding 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 of the bell. See a handful of uh waiters and waitresses. One of them a kind of a stocky female dwarf actually looks over to you guys. Be with you in a sec. Go over there. And she'll just kind of point over to an empty table. Well, you heard them. I head to the table. Hello, handsome. And she'll go back over to her working. All right. So, guys, sit down, get yourself comfortable, and you definitely get this absolutely warm and delicious smell of. Uh, fresh pastries and cinnamon, and you catch the the whiff of melted chocolate somewhere. Um, fresh fruit is kind of tingling in the air as well, and everything's kind of filled with a bit of laughter. You see some families in there with their kids giggling and throwing pieces of wa- syrup covered waffle at each other. Overall, it seems like a relatively nice place. After a few minutes, the Worf comes back over to the tables. Hi, lads. Hi. Sorry for the wait. Crazy still for the morning. And Zeno, I haven't seen you in a while. Introduce you to introduce me to your friends. You normally only come in here by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're back from a job, so it's a bit of a. Different crowd, uh, everyone. This is, and the DM's gonna give me the name because, of course, Zeno remembers it. Um, her name is Helga. Helga? Helga. Helga. Uh, this is Helga. Uh, lovely, lovely person. And, uh, Pleasure to meet you, Helga. It's, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. And, uh, Zeno, you have to pardon me. May I have everybody's names? It is a pleasure, and she'll put out her uh, her hand. She has this, um, she's kind of on, like, the middle-aged side. You can definitely see a little bit of, like, the wrinkles kind of showing in from age, though she still keeps herself fairly well. Um, kind of this, like, um, dirty blonde hair that you do see little bits of streaks in it that are starting to show, um, Show silver with the age. Um, well, unlike full dwarf, she doesn't have a full on beard, but she does have a nice section of mutton chops on the side that seem to be well kept. And a couple little beads are tied in there too that jingle when she walks. Uh, she does have this just plain white apron over top of what seems to be just common clothes that she keeps a, a little notepad and something related. Uh, well, um, my, uh, everyone else seems to be a little, uh, shy today. I am the Wall of Zariel. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I look at her and I'm like, It is a pleasure. I am Zero. It is a pleasure as well. And she'll go through and get the, the introductions from... Everybody here. I said, All right, wonderful. Well, Zeno, since you came here with company, are you here just for a black cup of coffee or are you actually ordering food oh, today? No, I want oh, chocolate peanut butter waffle, please. And also, yes, a cup of coffee. Absolutely. And then she takes a look over and says, Do you have anything that uh, 
that you're looking for in particular in regards to food. Otherwise, we have some great stuff. I'd be happy to surprise you. I'll take you up on that offer, Helga. I prefer a brave man. How about you, my dear? Zerelda? Hmm. What would you recommend? Well, if you're like any other of the halflings I know, you have a big appetite, yes? Yes. How would you like some strawberry stuffed waffles? Oh, stuffed? Stuffed sounds wonderful. Absolutely. All right. And to go ahead and gather the, we want the rest of the orders as well. I saw, I'm sure she'll pop back in here in a second. Um, so she goes and gathers the order with. All right, dearie, so I'll be back here with a couple with the with your drinks, and I'll be back here in a few minutes. And she goes and scurries off to the back to place the order in with the cooks. And you do see as she goes back, there's kind of just like the general like counter that leads back to the kitchen, and the wall of glass is there where you see like three or four gnomes. You see a, a human as well. Ooh, excuse me. That are back there. Some of them are absolutely covered in flour and uh, pulling out and cutting fruits and uh, prepping meats. And there seems to be a general, like, funness about that. Even though they're in a rush, you do hear the occasional joke or jab being tossed at one another when they're back there. Anybody who's worked as a cook understands exactly what that means. Best cup of coffee in Akamali, I swear. Oh, and the food's fantastic, and oh, they're just all so lovely. Wonderful. It definitely seems quite friendly and energetic in here. Loving the uh, vibe. That's not something uh, I would actually say in character. The vibe in here, but yes. Alright, so you guys have a chance to kind of relax for a couple of minutes, spark up any conversations on plans or anything you want to do. Sure. You guys want to take a minute to go over anything on that, or? I believe we do have an important subject, Zero. Yes? Your name, dear. Hey, I would like to have a new name. It is something that you uh, mentioned to us after taking down the Black Spider. I need a new name because I'm going to have a whole new, a new look. I'm going to go to my true form. It's going to be a new start for me. Have we seen your true form? Parts of it have kept it kind of... I guess, muted? The, the base shape or changeling form? I mean, I've showed you my changeling form, but I've stayed small. So, it, I mean, you technically see me, I'm just taller and older, I guess. I will look at Zero with slight perplexion. Yes, Saria. I'm not sure I follow. Uh, how are you changing more than you already do? I had to take different forms. And then she pauses and looks around. Is there anybody she recognizes? Um, go ahead and give me a perception check. Twenty-two. 
22? No, not anybody that she recognizes in here. All right. I had to take different forms and be very, very careful because of the cult and because of the family. I cannot be found. I have to find her first and bring her home. So you're dropping the disguise? Is that what I'm gathering? I'm safe with you guys. You're my new family. Would dropping your disguise put Vesper in danger? I don't know. But I don't think it matters anymore. Because if if she's dead, I have to bring her home. If she's alive, I have to find her. It doesn't matter what form she's in or what form I'm in. Either way, I have to bring her home. Mercy does have many eyes, though. I must agree with uh, young... Leopard here, that uh, it might be a bit dangerous to drop your disguise. And it might be even a little dangerous that I mentioned her by name. But it is ultimately your decision. Uh, now, as far as your name, we all have had our uh, discussion on what we... Uh, thought it might be. Is there anything that you would have in mind? Anything that you are trying to convey with your new name, your new persona? Well, I picked a surname. And I picked a name that I do like, that I will add to it whatever you guys pick within reason. Well, but name could be your choice. The final name will be my choice. I am protected by the Raven Queen. That's why I'm not afraid to drop my disguise. Whatever happens will happen. But my goal, my end goal, besides to bring Vesper home, no matter how I have to bring her home, is to honor the Raven Queen and to vanquish undeath in her name. Once again, agreeing with uh, uh, Little Leopard that it should ultimately be your decision, but with your goal in mind, what uh, you have as your driving force how about something such as in honor of the Raven Queen and Raven Corvina and the undeath aspect Wraith, Corvina Wraith. I like it. I like that a lot. What do you guys think? But you guys are family, too. It sounds like you. Thank you, darling. It's your name, so your choice. So if I put that name together with what I've already kind of chosen for myself, it would be Corvina Petrovia Wraith Von Emlach. Beautiful. A strong undead fighting name. I like it.
Now with that settled, anybody see our waitress? Wonder if they serve any uh any uh mead here. Yes, I understand it's the late uh, late morning. It's been a long oh, not at this hour, dear. And we we all deserve to relax now that we have reached a mark. Oh uh, yeah, one more thing before you start relaxing. Um just uh you don't have to worry about taking me to get the brand off before we go into the temple. Ah, uh, so you decided to go the route I suggested and uh, talk with them about it. I'm talking to you about it. <laughs> it's taken care of. What, what do you mean it's taken care of? I, I had a nice discussion with this really awesome druid, and I was invisible, and he was kind. It sounds like a fever dream a little bit. What did happen to our traveling companion, by the way? Uh, oh. Sorry, I apologize, I didn't state that. Um, whenever you guys hit the city, um, they said thank you and then went off on their own. Uh, for uh, Zeno's sake, um, after the uh, fight with the giant, she was still invisible from a spell and uh, took uh, one of them aside who used heat metal and then cure wounds. My character is unaware of this until now. But... Druid craft you like a, a little sling or a sleeve or something. They just burned it off and then cure wound it. No, oh, I know. I'm saying I'm asking this in character. Oh, I don't know what she did. Uh, no, I, I just took a deep breath and they burnt it off and I was okay. Oh. I told you it wasn't a big deal. I'm under the impression that you're expecting me to be disappointed in you, Little Zero, but... I'm just being honest. My, my concern was for your safety and your long-term safety as well with having a potential scar that could not be uh, removed. But it seems that everything worked out. I am happy for you. I don't agree with how it was done, but it is done. My point is, like I said, you guys are my party members. I trust you. And I couldn't go any further without being honest with you. We finally got to a place where we could sit down and talk. And I told you what happened. I think I speak for the party when I say that we do appreciate when you are honest with us. As uh, I remember you and Zeno having conversations about no secrets being had. Yes. Especially and regarding point... ki kidnapping anyone. Don't do that. Wait, what about kidnapping? I mean, all the time she wanted to take someone's child or take some random person and bring them along, and it's just like, we can't do that. Especially okay, so, so she didn't do it. Okay. As far as I'm aware. I mean, maybe she did, and who knows. But I don't believe this happened. Zero. Excuse me. Zillion. I don't want to get her name still. Covina. You didn't kidnap anyone, did you? 
Mm, check the bag of holding? I don't think so. I hope there's not a dead body in there, Commander. <laughs> Pretty sure there's just some frost giant bits. Oh, oh, great. Anyway. And a uh, well-made rocking chair. Yes. There is a rocking chair on the bag holding it now. Would that fit in the bag? I mean, with enough motivation, yeah. And on that note, uh, Helg comes back, a tray of food based on whatever you guys order, um, knowing Zeno, and she kind of gives you a little bit of a wink as she just sets the entire pot of coffee down on the table. Oh, you do know me so well, Helga. And she's like, all right, if you need anything else, let me know. She'll head back. Um, everything based on whatever you guys ordered is just has this absolutely wonderful smell to it. There's a particular reason why Zeno picked this place and the the food here just seems to be spectacular. For Zerelda, you asked on how big the waffles were. Um, yes. The waffle is about as big around as your face. Um, and That's it? However, <laughs> um, you can see the center of it is completely bowed out. And you could just She's a halfling. Her face is small. Okay, fine. About the size of the wall's face. How about that? There you go. Now, there you go. now we're talking yeah. about some waffles here. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the waffle looks perfect. Like, there's this big bowed center to it. And as you go and cut into it, this just heaping pile of steaming strawberries and the juices that come in with it just starts to pour out onto the plate. And wow. It's definitely sweet. You could get a little hint of like a salt flavor to it just to kind of pop the sweetness. Um, and then everybody's orders to, you know, any meat that was ordered is done perfectly. Uh, same thing too with um, any other drinks. The the coffee is brought over with a, a pitcher of cream to go with it, and something that's rare to find in, in anything but major civilized lands. Sugar. Um, oh, thank goodness. Probably one of the reasons why Zeno comes here is because sugar's something that's kind of a commodity. Fucking dumped half that shit in my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I drink my coffee black like a psychopath. Um, I didn't realize that. Until it was it's it's Wiggins waffles, right? Uh, whiffles. Whiffles. Like a whi like a whiffle ball bat. Ah, okay. Uh, Helga. Yes, dear. Uh, can you tell the whiffles I have a suggestion for a new menu item? Oh, I'm quite interested. Go ahead. So imagine a waffle, but it's filled with, you know, breakfast meats and some uh, maybe like candied bacon and uh, just a ridiculous amount of like chocolate and all of these kind of things. And you call it the waffle of Zario. With a little bit of little bit of chili for that nice breakfast kick. Uh, Zerelda, it, Zerelda is gonna speak up with her mouth full of um, waffles and strawberries and say, "That sounds delicious." Speaking of, I ordered uh, whatever Helga was going to surprise me with, Mister um, Detail-Oriented Voice in the Sky. What is front of me? What is in front of me? So, what is in front of you is probably about a, a couple inch thick porterhouse steak. Um, 
several huge eggs on top of it too. Like these are not regular eggs. You're not quite sure what exactly they are, uh, but they are definitely eggs of some sort, the way that they're cooked. Um, and mixed in with the eggs is different types of vegetables like onions and green peppers. Um, you catch flicks of probably sausage, you're going to guess. Um, and then you have a um, perfectly seasoned medium rare steak. Awesome. All right. It's funny, as you guys are all describing this, I'm like, damn it, I probably should have had dinner. <laughs> How did uh, Helga react to uh, Zeno's suggestion? And I'm assuming he gave me a sideways glance at the end of the suggestion. Oh, you better fucking believe I gave him a sideways <laughs> glance. She goes, I'll definitely talk to the owners about that. That sounds like a really interesting item. He even make it one of those, like, challenge meals, you know, where it's like you have to eat so much of it so quickly. It's like, I don't know. I'm just throwing shit out at this point. I love it. I'll go ahead and talk to Mr. Whistle. And with that, she'll head off, let you guys have whatever else that you're going to be discussing, and have your meals. So, Ms. Waffles, they're, they're a type of uh, super... It's like the you take kind of like a a batter and you cook it on a griddle, but it, the griddle has like spots in it, so you can make it more like a grid. I don't know if grids exist in high fantasy, but you know a grid. <laughs> As Leopard looks down strangely at the sweet bread waffle that has been placed in front of him. It's good, I promise. Alright. So you guys have your meal, have a couple of uh, laughs, and have uh, pretty much the whole day about you on what directions you guys want to go and what you want to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so are you guys all sticking together? Are you splitting up? Um, where are we heading? Zero will want to go to the uh, the temple as soon as possible. Leopard? I would ask um, Zero about any bookshops. Okay. Um, I believe do I know that? Corvina. Yes. I have to get used to that too now. <laughs> I've, I've, I've already made the uh, the name change in Roll20, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you, uh, both you and Zeno, go ahead and give me a history check. Um, Zeno, give me that roll with advantage. Uh, nope. Mine's a six. Uh, 22. Okay. Or excuse oh. me, 21. My math is something today. Okay. So, for bookshops, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, you'll be able to explain this to Leopard. Um, if you're looking for just general books, where you're at right now, Abdar's Promenade is probably a good place to start because this is largely the merchant district and the market district. Um, however, there is the Erdite Quarter, which is the next section of city over. Um, that is where the Arcanum, or the, the Lyceum is located. That is the most prolific arcane college in all of Tal'Dorei. Um, some of them say it's best in the world. Um, 
this uh, that's a big chunk is their like it's a college section of town but it's their arcane section uh, if you're looking for something that's really high end you might want to go to the cloud top district but the cloud top, top district is very much the uh, the high life in society um, and some of the stuff that you would find there is going to be absolutely spectacular but it also might be excessively overpriced and you also will know that getting into the cloud top districts you need for lack of better terms you need permission to get in there also i fucking hate going there they're all assholes Zerelda, the mention of the cloud top district does spark your ear though because yes it does okay you remember all right good yes my wife mistress <laughs> <laughs> do I I just know she's there generally Correct. or is there okay yeah, yeah she unfortunately didn't give you any directions what she gave you was a pass into the cloud top district okay the, the game is part of it I see Yeah, she's gonna she's gonna turn into wild shape into a dog, smell the card, and try to find. <laughs> it. Perfect. <laughs> we get a call from a really confused guard. I think we have your druid in the pound. <laughs> Can you come down and claim her? No. <laughs> So we have a direction for the temple. Um, Leopard is looking for a bookstore. Um, something else to to make note of, and you would sort of both uh, Corvina and um, Deno will be very familiar with because he is in this district. Is um, Gilmore's uh, Gilmore deals in magical items and oddities. And if you're looking for uh, spell books or scrolls, um, or at least produced ones, um, as well too as any type of adventuring things, he might be your best bet too. I'll explain that to Leopard. All those things. Leopard, if you're going to go see Gilmore, can you ask him for a price on something for me? Um, I don't believe I was headed that way. Okay. Then if I see him, I'll ask him. Alright. So you guys finish up your meals. And are you guys all going together to the various places? Or are you guys going to split up? I can tag along for a bit. Perhaps, um, we could regroup around here in about three hours. That's fair. I don't think too many people are going to be allowed in the temple anyway. Well, you all have fun on your errands. I'm going to stay here and drink all of this coffee. It's been too long since I've had a damn good cup of coffee, and I'm going to sit here and enjoy all of it. And it is a damn good cup of coffee. Fuck, Helga, when are you all going right. to tell me how you how you do this differently than everyone else? Oh, that is a well-known trade secret. You realize that? And by the... well-known... Yes, I'm fully aware of the uh, the contents of that joke. You can keep asking, though, dear. I, I, I love hearing you ask questions. You sure do like to make me beg for things. They probably brew it with cold sweat. Well, then that's fucking delicious. <laughs> I delicious promise you no taste. trolls were harmed in the making of that cup. <clears throat> All right. 
Well, then we have, just to clarify, so we have the temple, we have the cloud top district, and then we have the book hunt. And I'll probably go like check in my office to make sure there's like nothing there for me. Okay. Bring out the book meal. Yeah. I would probably, um, unless anybody was prompting <coughs> me elsewhere, I would probably hang out with uh, Zeno, um, drinking coffee, and then if he was heading to his office, I would uh, head to Gilmore's to uh, do all the deliver the news and stuff that we're supposed to be doing. That the magical voice in the sky will uh, assuredly tell me what I was supposed to tell Gilmore. Right, because there was actually a, a Gilmore thing that you did have to do. All right, so we have you guys going in all different directions, then, which is perfectly fine. Um, so I hope I you know, will... Wall. I'm not letting you. You're gonna have to get your own pot of coffee. Uh, Helga. Can I have a pot of coffee over here, please? Oh, when say you please get... again. I'm sorry? I said, oh, say please again. Please. Uh, I can see why he wants to make you a waffle. I'll be right back. I will blankly stare because I don't get it. She's an older dwarf woman who is flirting with you. Oh, okay. You get it's fine. Just don't worry about it. She's very nice. <laughs> All right. So um, let's take care of Corvinus first because I feel like that's probably going to take the most amount of time, and then we'll go from there. So. You head off to the Temple District. Okay. Um, as you see on the map, Temple District is a couple over, and unfortunately you do have to go through um, the other way around, so the Military District and the Cloud Top. Won't be one that you're able to get into. Um, so you do take the long way around, which takes you probably the better part of an hour to get to. Um, now, the coming in here, you do see various temples to the different gods. Um, the ones that really stand out that Amon holds dear is going to be for Arathus, the Lawbringer, as well too as the Platinum Dragon. Um, though you do see a couple smaller temples, one to Paylor the Dawnfather. Toward the Storm Lord, the roar of the Rob Mother, um, you do see a church for uh, Saren Ray, and then you do eventually get to yours. Um, each of them is set within the, the the base reliefs and the coloring details, respective for those deities. Um, the Temple for the Raven Queen is definitely one of the smaller ones. Uh, the section for it is closest to the cemetery district. It's actually kind of right in the corner that meets the two districts together. And you see these large black marble pillars, almost, almost like kind of like Greek Parthenon style. Um, that lead in this stone walkway of like um, cobblestone walkway to where it opens up into a much larger temple, um, all of which are made with blackened stones. And you do see details of obsidian, a little bit of purple hues to it with um, glass that you're not as familiar with. Um, the stained glass windows have these absolute gorgeous base reliefs of winged angels fighting against liches and uh, 
being these last bastions against hordes of undead. And standing at the entrance of the temple, you do see two black-garbed, um, heavily armored knights, one male, one female, um, both of which have a while they have their their uh, like breastplate of armor, they do have the draperies of that of the Raven Queen. You see the the blacks and the grays and the purples with the iconography, the holy symbols being not only dangling off of chains but also etched into the armor. And okay. as you approach, the both of them look to you. The female steps forward. Before I approach, on my way there, mm -hmm. in fact, um, before I even leave the diner, I will take my natural form so that I go into that temple as Corvina. Okay. So, before I leave the diner, I take the form that they've seen me before. Pale white skin, white hair, but I am six foot tall. I have the the tattoos that you've seen on the picture that I've shown underneath the eyes and on along the sides of my face. Still the same that they've seen me as when I was zero, but taller, a little older. Not like old, old, but more mature. And I approach them as Corvina, not as Little Zero. The uh, the knight steps forward and approaches. I'm assuming that you're wearing the the holy symbol. Yes. Out, correct. Correct. King sister. Greetings. It is always welcome to see a, a new face and bless these darkened halls. How can we be of service? I am here to do, do my communion, to have my name written in the tome as a new cleric or the Raven Queen and to leave an offering for her. Excellent. Then we will show you to the communion chambers and make the priests aware of the, the needed rituals. Okay. We do ask that before you enter, that you do remove any weapons of any kind. None okay. is to um, be armed going into the sanctum. She starts to take her daggers and everything off. Uh, where do they go? Safety. She goes, I will collect them, and then I will show you exactly where I'm placing them. Okay. She'll start removing okay. her multiple weaponry. All right. So you kind of do the whole Elizabeth Swan thing. Um, the walk in through the uh, the first set of doors into kind of like the antechamber. Um, and for lack of better terms, there's essentially just copy bags. Um, she collects the weapons for you, places them within the respective places that they will fit, and you watch as she places each one of those in there and is respectful with their care, considering what they are and that you are uh, a new entry into the church. Mm -hmm. Come, sister. In this case, then, she will continue to walk into uh, the general um, church section where you would have, like, your pews and everything like that. Um, the absolutely stunning view of the lights that are kind of coming through the stained glass and it has this real mixture of the battle of light and dark almost by the way that the lights 
shine through the glass in almost prism-like fashion. Um, because you do have your varying highlights of, you know, regular light coming through the clear glass and um, there's notes of pink and light reds and um, little uh, shines of blue contrasting with like the dark grays and the purples. And it really is kind of a stunning view as you're walking in and past the pews up to the altar. You see this absolutely large, um, almost like a basalt, I think is the appropriate type of rock for that, uh, basalt statue of the Raven Queen, the, the black robes, the large flowing black wings, and then the simple, almost expressionless white mask. She leads you beyond that room into a simple antechamber. She says, in the cabinet there is robes for you to change into. I will go now and inform your sister. Okay. At which point she'll turn and leave you to allow you to get changed. Right. She'll start stripping down, put on the robes. Okay. Uh, the robes are kind of a very soft feel compared to the hard clothes you're used to wearing. Very satiny, like silky texture to them. And in this um, kind of wine colored maroon. There are a couple of minutes of waiting. The chamber opens up and you do see a priestess step out. Um, she is a dark elf, almost purplish skin with white hair, um, wearing similar robes, though with a couple more adornments to kind of show the rank within the church. And so, sister, welcome. I was to understand that you were coming here to register your name in the book and to take your first communion. Yes. Please. She will turn around and take you further into the inner sanctum of the church. Now you do end up going down a couple of corridors um, until you finally get to the communion chamber. The communion chamber is made of very similar black stone to what you've seen throughout. Um, the different stained glass windows that are up near the top of the um, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Try that again. Words are hard. Um, the ceiling leads up into a dome where the dome is all of that same kind of stained glass. In the center of the room, you do see several of the priests and priestesses to the Raven Queen. And as you go down, you see a small conclave of stone uh, with a set of stairs that walks down with two large arcs that go like this. Each of the arcs is detailed in stone to look like raven's wings. She goes, stand down there under the center, and then the communion will begin. Okay. So, you walk down the steps, and the steps are cold on your bare feet. As you off further in, you stand directly in the center, underneath where the two arcing points almost meet. At that point, the chanting begins. You hear the prayers, and the prayers take this note of being, um, you hear inflections of it that are very high-pitched, almost soprano-like, and what you'd expect out of like a church choir then you also hear these like E minors that are a little bit off tone and it's both it, it kind of like everything within the church it's a little bit of contradiction to itself in being absolutely gorgeous but kind of haunting at the same time as these prayers go through you start 
adhering the, the specific wording of the, the prayers to the Raven Queen, asking for a blessing on the new person that is to be entered. As you start to hear liquid running around you, you don't see anything as of yet, but you do hear it seemingly being moved through pipes of some sort. And from where the tops are at, to I don't want to necessarily say triples because it doesn't fit it because it's they're probably about maybe six inches in diameter so it's a, a stream but it's not you know not blasting at you for lack of better words right uh, but two heavy pores of what seems to be blood rain down on you your face gets absolutely covered and drenched, so does the robes. You're completely sapped with this sticky and very cold blood, and you know that it's blood. You've had it on you plenty of times whenever having to stab somebody. And start to have that thought of, where does one get so much blood? But then your mind clears a little as you accept the communion that you're in, you feel it starting to pull at your feet and up to your ankles, and then your vision goes black. And the only thing you hear is the chanting. Um, there's no... Nothing else besides that. You do feel the cold. You still feel the blood pouring over you and gathering at your feet. And then that starts to sound more distant and becomes more of an ambient sound. And and there's almost nothing. A moment passes. And then you hear a voice. The voice is female. And it's behind you and all around you. Almost um, uh, disassociated. As you turn and you do see the white porcelain mask and the black form of the Raven Queen. Hello, child. Corvina looks up at her and smiles. Matron of Death, mm. Mother of Past Souls, I come to you. No longer as Lost Souls Hero, but as faithful cleric and follower. Corvina Petrovia Ray von Hemlock, a name given both by the Sound family and myself. A name that will carry generations of undead slayers long after I've passed. I walk into this school once still turning of what I've learned done to a great and kind family. I want to be clean from that guilt and focus only on my goals, to help my friends and finish my quest, vanquishing undeath and the cult of the chained oblivion, in your name. Those are high promises, child. And we do welcome you here with open wings. I have followed you for quite a while. At least ever since Winter's Crest. You have a story about you. And one that seems interesting to see unfold. As with the communion and your welcoming within the church and even for your 
refounding of yourself. You have made it a long way. What questions do you have for the matron of Wales? Is uh, Vesper Tirolo, daughter of Vexali and Percival Tirolo, still alive? I don't know. She has gone from my sight, but she has not yet passed. Okay. The cult of the chained oblivion from which I came, who took Vesper, in what direction should we be looking for them? A large organization has them. Their faces change. They have many goals that span without the, the continent of Taldore and some even into Wild Mount and the others. The particular one that has taken her has passed slain by those that they found themselves loyal to. Perhaps this was uh, treachery, or simply their purpose had been solved, and the death was there to make them silent to questioning. My final question. I would like to sacrifice for a simple request, a prayer or blessing of sorts, if that's possible. Please give your gracious favor to all of Zariel when he is in greatest need, for he stands between merciless, unnatural monsters and our party, always keeping us and everyone he meets safe. Protect him as he protects us. And what do you sacrifice for this offer? Myself. I do not accept. You have a path to walk, and to shorten that path now would be counterproductive on your wishes, Priestess Corina. Then I shall protect him myself. And that you will. You have strength about you, little one. And the more that your faith grows, the more that strength does as well. You will be a, a very good mortal guardian for those that are near you. And for those you have yet to meet. Thank you. And with that, he steps back and he just watches the the mask fades to gray and then it's gone. And you wake up. You don't necessarily know how much time has passed. Uh, you are no longer in the pool. Um, you have a couple towels wrapped around you. Um, you are definitely stained red. <laughs> um, as the uh, the priests have essentially pulled you out of the pool and have placed you on the sign for you to recover from your injury. One of the priests sits there. 
Well, we were out for quite a while, so decided to sit here with you and wait till you woke up. Thank you. Why was I out so long? What happened? Nothing happens. You just were in your trance. Time moves differently in communions, kind of like in planes. Sometimes minutes can be minutes. Sometimes minutes can be hours. You've been out for four hours. Interesting. I am okay. Thank you. Good. Let's get you cleaned up. And then you can collect your belongings as well to the guard who let you in who will direct you to the temple. Actually, I like this. Party will think it's fun. I get stuff, then I go find party. Very well. All right. So with that, we will leave it there. And then let us do, we'll do Leopard next. All right. So, Leopard, you step outside of the coffee shop. A couple different directions that you were given to go to, um, being the Erdite Quarter to look up the various arcane aspects of it, uh, Gilmore's as a place to shop, uh, as well to as potentially the Cloud Top District or even just a local bookstore that's found in this own quarter. Uh, which direction are you heading? Just, just a regular bookstore. Okay. So, um, go ahead and give me... Just give me a general wisdom check. Great. Give me a sec, I never remember stats. Oh good. Seventeen. Okay. So you're able to go around. It takes you a little bit since you're not familiar with the city and human cities are kind of confusing the way that they're set up compared to home. And after about maybe a half hour or so, um, you do find uh, Tabitha's texts. The looks to be a small bookstore, um, not particularly busy. It's a kind of off of the main drag on where a lot of the shops are. Step into the the establishments, and you definitely catch that whiff of pages and prints and old books. Uh, behind the counter, you do see a small half-elvish woman, uh, kind of big glasses on her face, as she's doesn't seem to have anybody else in the store and is lost in a, a book of her own. Um, she definitely seems to be on the younger side, as half elves are concerned, probably the human equivalent of like early twenties. And as you come in, the bell rings. She kind of snaps back at attention, hearing the bell, closes the book real quick. I'm I'm sorry. Hi, hi. How can I help you? Hello, Miss. Um, I was wondering if you have any books of local poetry in stock. Local poetry. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so get up and start to uh, come around the counter and just, you know, follow me. We actually have a whole section of it. Are you looking specifically for local for Iman, or are you looking for a specific writer or a specific culture? Um, I think local for Iman would be my favorite. She'll head back into a section of the, the books, and if you've ever been in a, a Barnes & Noble, you know kind of what this is like. Mm -hmm. You know, going to different sections are labeled for different things, and she does have a section listed for poetry. 
Um, he goes, well, this is this here is for a mon. It should show a section of the bookshelf. It's probably about like eight or nine books. Um, he goes, and as you go further down the section, you'll find it from uh, different cities. Uh, you are going to find different cultures as well. There will be elven poetry. I'm pretty sure there's some dwarven ballads mixed in there somewhere. Um, I actually think we even have a couple of them from out in Wildmouth as well. Um, uh, I can never remember the the name of the, the place. Uh, the place with all the dark elves. Uh, there's a couple poetry books from there as well. Thank you. Of course. I shall get up and turn around and walk back over. If you need anything, just let me know. I will. Okay. Um, are you looking for anything in particular? Or? No, I just spend some time and eventually take a couple volumes to purchase. Okay. Um, since I didn't know that was a direction that you were going. I'll create some titles for you at another time. Okay. Um, go ahead and mark off, let's say, five gold for okay. the, the titles. Say that you picked up, uh, say, a gold piece for each book. So five books? Sounds good. Okay. Was there anything else for Leopard to be looking for, or is that it? No. That's it for now. Okay. All right. So we'll do next uh, Zeno and the Wall. So the two of you end up going back to your office. Um, um, your office. Who, who drank more coffee? Please. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, if you guys want to turn this into a drinking contest, we could make this a constitution save. No, no, I got to get the Gilmore's eventually. No I, alcoholic coffee. I believe the wall is going to Gilmore's and I'm going back to my office. Yeah. We're splitting okay. when we leave the Wiffles Waffles. Apologies, I thought you said that you were going with him to his office and then to Gilmore's. No, we're well, then... just enjoying some coffee together as friends do. Yeah. Understood. And then go um, separate ways. Alright, so then we will do Gilmore's first and then your office. Alright. Cool. So, you head towards... Uh, where Zeno directs you for Gilmore's Glorious Gifts. And after a little bit of searching, he gave you pretty good directions, and it's exactly where you said it is. Um, it is right on the main street, um, and it's hard to miss. Uh, Gilmore's Glorious Goods, as labeled on the glass and a sign that's hanging out over by the door, is a broad, single-story facade um, where... You can see even through the window different um, different apparatus that are in there that kind of puff and smoke, and you see um, as you walk in um, rows of books and um, different uh, wizarding components that you would um, see people have in pouches and use for spells. Um, you do see various trinkets hanging about um, and then at the desk um, you do see a uh, half of an elf yeah, half elven woman as well um, she's currently poring over a book um, she seems to be probably in her human equivalent to late 20s um, she has a uh, dirty blonde hair, another, uh, another half elf that, or another wizardy looking individual, thick glasses as well. As you walk up to the counter and all of your glory, she'll take a look up. 
I've never seen you before. Hello. I've never been in Mon in Iman before. This is my first time to the city. Good morning. Hello. My name is Sherry. How can I help you? I'm actually looking for Gilmore. His brother? His right? Brother? Friend. His his friend. friend. Oh magical voice in the sky, if you could remind me his name. Gundren. His friend Gundren actually uh, sent myself and those I travel with who have gone on various errands around the city uh, with a message. And I believe one of them, who's going to have to remind me, uh, actually wanted to either sell or buy something from him. I forget. Um, would he happen to be around? Did I hear my name? As you uh, you asked that question behind the counter and uh, behind her on the walls, you do see various not only accoutrement but um, various what would probably be magical items, swords and uh, robes and various trinkets. Um, and behind you see this lavish purple uh, curtain. And his hand goes and pulls it back, and Gilmore steps out. Um, or at least who you would assume. Uh, Gilmore is, uh, he is human, um, definitely more on the older side, though. Um, wouldn't necessarily say older, that's probably the bad way of putting it. He's human probably in his 40s at this point, 40s to 50s. Um, he has these uh, purple and gold trimmed robes made of exquisite material. Um, various golden chains with medallions and jewels hanging off of his fingers have uh, rings and rings on them, some with gems, some with bands. And just has this absolute uh, giant smile on his face. He steps out and all of his wonderment and glory. And hello, I have never seen you before, my friend. But I did hear my name and a friend of mine. Hello, my name is Gilmore. Hello, That's Gilmore. Nice. And I shake his hand. Uh, my mm -hmm. name strong is... Strong grasp. <laughs> hello, my friend. I am the Wall of Zariel. Uh, as I, yeah, it's a was... pleasure to meet you. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard that today. Uh... <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, as I was explaining to your uh, uh, your colleagues here, um, your friend, friend. Uh, your friend, <laughs> we helped him with a uh, minor errand of clearing out a certain dwarven mine of a uh, black spider uh, wizard um, and uh, reacquiring the magic forge. And I will also iterate whatever else Fandrin. Fendrin? I've already forgotten his name. Um, Gundren. Say that one more time. Gundren. Wow, I was way off. That Gundren wanted uh, us to uh, iterate uh, for Gilmore. Oh, that sounds like some nasty business you got yourself wrapped in there, friend. But I will be more than happy to reach out to him. I heard that he was on this, this quest to reclaim this lost mine and his uh what he thought was a, a dwarven artifact and it sounds like he had found it that seems to be quite profitable for both himself and me sherry go ahead and get uh get things prepared we'll go ahead and take a trip down the to the emerald outpost and pay our dwarven friend a visit and you my friend are you going to be staying around town or am i to interest you in any wares those 
that armor of yours is quite exquisite, and so is that sword. I don't imagine there's much that I could sell you aside from maybe some potions. Uh, hmm. I think you would look actually really nice in a cloak. I might be in the market for a fashionable cloak. Um, Absolutely. Who isn't? I, I, exactly. Um, as far as any magical items for myself, I'm not entirely uh, opposed to browsing wares, but I am pretty set at the moment. Um, and I will actually um, demonstrate that the Magic Forge is a real thing by showing him the uh, um, platinum ring that was turned magic item uh, three okay. episodes ago. And I will uh, yeah, explain how that all came about. And I'm assuming you hand him the ring. I mean, I have no reason to trust or distrust him. So, yeah, I would hand him the ring, expecting that I'm going to be getting it back. Of course. All right, so he takes a look over the ring and see a couple, well, he mutters a couple words as he, uh, he enchants on it that's actually placed on the ring. You see some of the, the arcane nature that was wound into it, kind of illuminate off of the ring a little bit as he's looking it over quite a feat, considering the story that you made. Normally, the magic creation of a ring takes a lot of time, energy, effort, and probably a lot of swearing and, and sue. This is quite nice for what it is. It's a simple enchantment, but it seems to be worthwhile. I'm going to hand that back. Because I will definitely be paying our dear friend a visit then. If I could use this to speed up my own wares, that, uh, that will make this even grander, and I could finally open up that second store. Oh, a second store. You might be uh, looking for some uh, uh, outsourced management, and uh, I'm, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friend, well, I have, uh, I have a lot of people that would be willing to help me run the thing. I have never been one to shy away from the needs of the Adventurers. And I've never been one to say that we couldn't help sponsor anybody as well. We help get the name of Gilmore's Glorious Goods out there, and I could always take off a little bit of prices on things. That is an intriguing offer. As I said, I'm not myself looking into any wares, but perhaps I shall bring the party around um, probably tomorrow, to be realistic. Um, and, uh, perhaps there might be something that, uh, uh, we might be able to strike that bargain with and, uh, make it known that we, uh, obtain these miraculous magical items at Gilmore's, I forget the adjective, wares. Ah, so close, my friend. Gilmore's glorious goods. Glorious goods, I am so sorry. Uh, oh, I am fine. Trust fucking me, up it will this be... uh, negotiation. <laughs> oh, my dear friend, he takes your hand real quick. You are doing marvelous so far. Uh, I will take my hand back and be uncomfortable. <laughs> go ahead and bring your friends here. We cater to adventurers and... Yes, you may have everything that you require. I mean, you have all of that already on you. But as adventurers do, you guys encounter trinkets. And you encounter items of power. And you need places to get rid of such things. And I am more than happy to take them off of your hands. In which case, I could resell them. Or use them for my own magical studies. And then, if there's any ever anything that you need crafted or um, information on where to find things, I'm definitely within that uh, the category of being able to help there. Fantastic. Well, uh, with the uh, errand fulfilled and uh, that agreement of 
uh, coming around tomorrow. I believe that I will actually head out. And as I, um, depending on, well, not really depending, but if he wants to shake hands again, nice to meet you, blah, 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 blah pleasantries. Um, I will, uh, as I'm leaving, I, if there is a party member, I do remember somebody saying about Gilmore's before we decided where we were all going. If that she party member. She didn't go into any more detail other than mentioning that. Never mind. Then I will actually just um, leave. Um, because my business, as far as I know, is done. All right. Good day, my friend. And good day to you as well. All right, and then that is actually where we will take a break. So I will go ahead and uh, we'll be back here in, let's say, maybe 10 minutes. And then All we'll right. pick up with the next thing, okay? Yeah. Sounds good. All right.
All right. I want to thank you guys and welcome back. All right. So then uh, where we had left off was uh, the wall just had a conversation with uh, Gilmore. Next, we'll go ahead and head into Zeno's territory. So, Zeno, uh, you return back to your office. You know, it's been a little over a month now since you were there. And everything seems to be relatively in order um, from where you had left it. Though, whenever you do put your key in and open up the door to the office, the door kind of hits a pile of mail that's kind of, uh, mail's probably the wrong word, um, messages that just kind of scatter as the door opens up and flutter into the darkened office. I guess I'll look through the messages and why I light up a cigarette. Okay. So, you take a look through uh, the the messages that are there. Um, a couple of those pretty standard stuff. A few people sending you thank you notes for um, the last case that you were on. Uh, so notes from uh, uh, the the local guard in regards to an issue they were having with a magic item that wasn't operating the way that it normally does. Um, and the note was titled about two weeks ago to ask you to come in and take a look at it. Um, the last thing, however, seems to be the most prolific. Um, there's about four or five messages in regards to magic items specifically. Um, a couple of them are reports of mysterious deaths that have happened either due to an explosion um, or various like almost wild magic level effects that have gone off and one note that is from the local detective amongst the guard that you've had a work relationship with uh, it simply is kind of detailing some of the information they've gathered from these cases that they're showed in the notes and states that uh, Zeno, I believe that your original assessment of this not being something bigger may have been not 100% accurate. We're seeing reports of or hearing reports from the various class members that we've arrested for an individual known as the mechanic seems that they're the ones that might be supplying these hazardous items and we would like to request your assistance again in trying to help us track down this individual And it'll be signed uh, Detective Harris. Um, does Harris mention how many people have died as a result? Um, he doesn't say any that's in the report, but from the different things that have slid another door, you know that there's at least three. Well, this has all kind of been accumulating over the past, like, three weeks. Senna would go, probably head over there to pay them a visit. Okay. Because this is work. All right. Um, so you close up shop. Um, and by the way, since you have the city map located, or city map up, where is your shop located in the city? Oh, I thought you were going to tell me that, mister. Uh, I imagine um, I, it would probably be... Uh, uh, probably near the diner, so... Okay. 
Uh, that I mean, was magical that. was the guide did it say near the diner. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, that'd be in Avdar's promenade then. Yeah. Okay. Probably so like a little bit closer to the military district, but. Okay, and that's where you'll end up be heading then. Um. So head to the the military district. Um. You do know that there is, of course, the main military training grounds. A lot of the the main guard and detective hubs are there, um, as well too as the prison for the city. Um, and that is I'm trying to find the name of that real quick. Uh, the Black Bastille. So heading into the uh, the main guardhouse where the detectives are there, and you do see a couple of what you would assume are class members that are yelling obscenities at the the guards, and looks to be a couple of college lo- college age students from the the university are probably there, um, sitting on a bench, not really saying or doing anything while they're either sobering up or trying to figure out what they're going to say to get out of trouble. And as you walk through the familiar precinct, you find the desk for Detective Harris. Uh, Detective Harris, as you take a look over the familiar face, um, another human. Um, He's got a really gnarly scar Across his cheek that never really healed right. Um, definitely in his like late forties, you can see the the black and white peppered hair mixed in with his uh, original colors. Uh, kind of a thin beard that goes down to a small goatee. Um, he does wear the standard uniforms for the Iman guard, um, though you do see that he has the, the armor to show his rank as being a detective. Uh, long sword leaning in sheath against the desk. Currently he's sitting there working on some paperwork. Sorry I've been indisposed, Harris. I was on another job that took a bit of time and lots of bugbears. Well, Zeno, welcome back to the city. I'm glad you decided to show up. He says that kind of in a jest. As he stands up, shakes your hand. Like, I see that, uh, I assume that you coming down here is based off of the information that I left you, correct? Correct. I'm kind of glad that you're back, to be completely honest. Um, It's hard to really tell what's going on with this. As you know, we do have issues with class. We have issues with the Lyceum. Those two groups have a little bit more control over the city than the higher-ups would like to admit. However, both of them don't really... Don't really acknowledge this one's individual, the the mechanics um, operations. Um, the couple of people we've talked with class said they have purchased his wares, they have fenced stuff for him, but they don't they don't specifically work for him. And the Lyceum, they have told us as an official report that they spent so much time and resources repairing the city, that they're not looking forward to it exploding. But we're kind of at a dead end here, and we don't necessarily know on what direction to go to be able to find this individual. Well, I guess we start with what we know. Where were the explosions? Who was caught in the blast? Do we know what caused it specifically? So... The first one, and we've 
kind of had some troubles or something else too that's not entirely related i don't think um but the reports are kind of muddled to be completely honest um the first of the explosions was a wand misfiring uh, that happened in the lower city in the, in the sewers um, that was two class members having a drunken brawl with one another, and instead of them relying entirely on fists, one of them pulled a wand. And instead of it going off the way that he wanted, it exploded and took several of his fingers with him. In the central district was the most recent one. Seems to have been some type of a magical lamp. Um, a common one from what others are saying from the... They had bought it originally off of a street vendor. Um, street vendor is yet to be found. But supposedly it was just a simple lamp that keeps light, a continual light one. That explosion was so big it actually took out two houses. Um, there are a couple of the family members that were in critical condition that were sent over to the temple districts for priest Saren Ray to look over. Uh, but there were five confirmed deaths from that one. From a lamp? From a lamp. Fuck's sake. And then... Mm. The last one that we have a report on is a sword. And the person who was actually purchased by one of the new recruits here in the military district, they took it out as a test run, and it ended up slicing six people, flew out of his hands, and started to fly and attack people. We have two deaths from that one. Do we still then, have that sword? The sword is locked in a box. Um, we were able to wrangle it, but it still is trying to fly around and attack people. Now, the last one I determined was unrelated. Um, there was a massive fire in the Central District two days ago. Um, however, that, after doing some investigation, did not have anything to do with the actual, uh, any actual magic items from what we were able to tell. Um, from what we're able to determine, that was set by a, an individual. And as you know, back whenever... Thordak had ruled over the city. Crack Bastille had been cracked open. Now we have caught a lot of criminals since then, but there is still a few of them that we're never able to find. And while this is only a hunch, the amount of destruction that was caused is very similar to a half-elf that we had chased down and arrested before. So, they, uh, uh, ex-Fire Ashari named Illamen Falcon Son. Um, and then, just above the table, is Harris someone that Zeno would, like, know is thorough and, like, know that he does his job? Like, he, he's not some, like, yes. two-bit detective? Correct, yeah. He's definitely uh, Detective Gordon compared to, uh, fuck, what was his partner's name? I can't remember. But yeah, he's competent. Okay. So, we don't know if the mechanic is just making, essentially, magical bombs, or 
if these are just supposed to be functioning items and they're not functioning, do we, and we only have the, the one, I'm assuming the rest are scrap at this point since they've exploded. Correct. I mean, the only way that we even know what they were is from witnesses. Do we know where the recruit bought the sword? Do we know what they were thinking they were buying? Were they intending to buy something magical? Whenever we spoke with the gentleman, he intended on buying a magical sword. He'd been saving up some of his uh, some of his earnings as a guard, and he was a new guard, and, but definitely headstrong and proud, and wanted to have his own personal sword. So apparently he saved up some money, but didn't have enough to go and buy one off Gilmore. So he found a merchant. Said that the merchants just simply had a didn't even have a cart. He just had a, like a rolled out blanket and wares. And he saw the magical sword. The gentleman had proved to him that it was magical. And then after that, he came back to the guardhouse, gave it a test run, and the sword went berserk. It's hard to believe I'm saying the sword went berserk. It's not like they have personalities, but... Someone to be flying with the intent to harm. Um... I can take a look at it. I mean, I won't take it out of the box, but I can at least try to figure out what's in it. Sure. At that point, he'll get up. He'll actually grab his own sword and strap it to his, his waist. Like, just in case. Hmm. So he heads back out to the... Uh, where they do keep their evidence. And... As you walk into the, the evidence locker, and you're greeted with various things. That stuff that you know that you helped them put in there. Um, but just different various items from crimes and things that are just are all tagged and documented. And as you start to head into it, you do hear the sound of wood and metal rattling against the stone floor. And you find, uh, like, a steamer trunk. Um, it has been locked shut, and it's rattling around. Something is inside moving, trying to, to stab its way out. As we do have it chained and secured in there, but we haven't wanted to open it up since then, seeing how deadly it is. I, uh, I don't blame you. I think I would want a sword, you know, rattling around, swinging around, stabbing around. Uh, and I would like to use identify on the sword. So for that, you are going to have to open the box and touch it. Oh, good. <laughs> you said it is chained up in there, right? Yes. Uh, As but for safety measures, I'll step uh, several steps back. I was going to say maybe take a couple steps back. And right, he'll take a couple steps back, and his hand will kind of just hover over his own sword. Um, I will. Just in case something like maybe one of the chains is faulty, I'm going to have as I open it. I'm going to have um. Yeah, I'm gonna have that ready to go just in case. Okay. And so at the very least, I can keep it away from me. Uh, but yeah, I'll open the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Ah, uh, seven. Um, so you open up the box, and it's just as he described. Um, looks to be a somewhat ornate uh, scimitar, though the blade's a little bit heavier than a traditional scimitar. Um, 
seems to be a couple like semi precious gems, uh, gems set into the hilt, and it seems to be relatively pretty. You can see why it caught somebody's eye. Um, it is uh, definitely chained in there. The chains have been hammered down into the bottom of the trunk, and while it does seem to have some leverage to move back and forth a little bit by a couple of inches, um, it hasn't been able to like saw off the chains or move around much to fly out. Um, you do see a pretty wicked serrated edge on it. Um, it doesn't seem to have been dulled from the chain. And looking it over, you do see the chain has been damaged a little bit, but seems to still be holding strong. Um, once you open it up and you're able to go ahead and cast Identify on it, um, it seems to be the magic item version of a flying sword. The flying sword uh, is creature. It's an animated object. Um, but you don't know on how this was smuggled in, but this is just simply an object that has been animated and designated to, to kill somehow. Still there, Zeno? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. Okay. So, Harris, did, did the recruit, or did the, I said the recruit, Jesus. Uh, did the guard utter a command word or something? No. All he said was take a look at this, and he had the sword out, gave it a couple test swings, and it flew out of his hand. At first, he thought it was a mistake. Thought he just didn't have a grip on it, and apparently some of the guards had laughed at him for it. And then it came it stuck into the sand, pulled itself out of the sand, and then started to fly around. And just to clarify, it was enchanted with the intention to kill people. Like Correct. Okay. I will close the box. <laughs> Uh, well, Harris, we did learn something, or rather, I learned something. Uh, I believe I, our dear mechanic friend is intending all of this. Uh, the enchantment on the sword was specifically to whip around and slice and dice people, so. Oh, that's disconcerting. Yeah, here I thought we were just dealing with some idiot who wanted to maybe give the actual magic merchants a run for their money, but apparently we might be dealing with something a little bit more sinister than that. As well, I'll let you take points on this one. As always, you, uh, these are the kind of odd cases that we just don't always have the resources for. If you have access to any of my files, anything that you want, the interviews, I'll get you what you can. Yeah, and can we get the any of the witness reports from the, the lamp explosion? Sure. As, uh, we'll head out by my desk. I'll go ahead and get the, the files. And like that, he'll head out, lead you out of the evidence locker. Then head off to get the the information and the dossier. Um, over the course of the week, I'll type some stuff up for you. Okay. All right. So that's where we'll hold you off for now. Zeralda. Yes, indeed. Thank you for being patient, dear. Um, <laughs> whenever the party splits six ways or five ways. You, Everybody kind of gets their, their limelight at time, so I appreciate your patience. <laughs> no, it's fine. All right. So you said that you're heading to the Cloud Talk District, yes? Yes. Okay. And I am going to wander around until I find her. <laughs> All right. So you head to the Cloud Talk District. 
Um, the big thing that kind of sets apart from the rest of it is while everything is pristine, there is definitely a certain contrast to the ruined tower or the ruined castle up on the hill. You make it to the gate into the Cloud Top District, and originally they do stop you, kind of give you this look because you've been traveling for a little while. And you probably look a little rough around the edges a little. But you present your your letter of entry and they'll open the gates and let you through. I uh, nod my head and thanks. Right. And uh, enter. All right. As you get past the, the gates and past the, the walls, um, you do see kind of the, the pristine culture that would be expected of the upper crust. Um, large expanses of houses, massive yards, uh, privacy fences, um, people that are dressed in um, jewels and clothes that's not befitting for the winter uh, because beauty is pain. <laughs> as you walk through, and they all kind of give you a look as you're wandering through, and you do see... Um, go ahead and give me a perception check, actually. Okay, let me grab my dice real quick. Is that uh, wisdom? Yes. Okay. to do that is a 19 okay so uh something that you just notice as you're you're coming through here is that you have seen one elf um that is dressed in the high fashion um and the rest of everybody you've seen is human. And while Iman is definitely a human city, um, there has been a nice spattering of races as you've moved through. Um, mm -hmm. The upper crust, however, is predominantly human. And it's just okay. something that you keep track of as you walk through. And when you do notice some of the glances that people give you, and you might be assuming that might be the fact. Okay, got it. All right. Now, uh, how is it that you're trying to find Lorana's place? Um. Hmm. She didn't give me any hints. Just told me she was in Cloud Top. She... Correct. Okay. Um. I'm just gonna go with. Uh, my plan is to light up my rosewood smoking pipe and wander around uh, blowing smoke until she smells my bud and comes to find me. <laughs> and true is a real fashion. <laughs> Alright. So, you... Wander through the streets. Um, go ahead and give me another persuasion or no, uh, perception check. Okay. Sixteen. Okay. So, after wandering around for probably about a half hour, you do catch the name on the uh, on a door. And the last name just simply, or the name just simply says Vale Estate. As you take a look over the letter, that is in fact her last name. Okay. Um, does it look like anybody's home? 
Um, it's in the middle of the day, so you would assume so. Um, you don't see, you know, lights on or anything, but it's also daytime. Um, okay. Unless you're peering through the windows, you don't know. <laughs> no. No, putting your eyes up to the glass. No. I'm trying to keep this one around. <laughs> Let's not get her arrested. Yeah. Well, my characters get arrested. Jeez. Um. Anyway. Um. Okay. So, uh, Zerelda will look herself up and down, and uh, you know, straighten her tunic. Make sure her dreads are looking nice. Uh, she'll walk up to the door and uh, give a confident nice confident knock I, I, uh, that was role played so well I heard that <laughs> <laughs> alright so after a, a moment or two the door opens up and you do see a much older man, um, probably in his 60s. He's kind of hunched over a little bit. Um, and you do actually meet him eye to eye, as he is an old halfling. Okay. He opens the door. Uh, y- yes, dear. Hello. Hi, hello. Um, I'm looking for somebody, and I was wondering if you could help. Sure, my dear. You lost. Uh, no, um... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I would say, stands there, and he's kind of wobbling a little bit on his cane that he's holding in place. Um, Zerelda will tell him, uh, no, not lost, uh, looking for a friend, and I think you might know her, or she might live here, Lorana. Oh, yes, mistress of Lorana. Follow me, dear. He kind of turns around and shuffles, you see him kind of move and stretch a little bit. As he uh, goes through, and he walks slowly, he's he's definitely an old halfling. <laughs> as you step into the room, uh, or it goes past like the original entryway and kind of into the bigger um, the the bigger foyer, um, it's kind of that classic like dual staircases that wind up to the top that meets like a statue and various side doors things are you do see various tapestries that are hung and you do see a lot of motif in regards to ships um, a lot of the uh, iconography is you know ships on the ocean or fishing vessels um the statue up near the, the top is a very beautifully crafted mermaid holding a trident. As he Ooh. steps in, goes, wait here. Oh, I'll get us. I'll, I'll summon the mistress. Excuse me. Oh, start to kind of shuffle and wobble off into one of the rooms. Um. Sure. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say I was. I will wait patiently. Okay. And, uh, after a couple minutes of waiting, um, you do see. Uh, Lorana does step out. Um. Absolutely stunning. Red-skinned tiefling that you had spent, uh, several wonderful hours with. That's uh, Winter's Crest. 
she's dressed in what seems to be a little bit more professional clothes. Um, see a very well-made um, dress that's on her. Nothing extravagant like you know what you would take to a social event, but something that is to indicate uh, maybe a profession or something like that. Uh, she's dressed in kind of a contracting or contrasting like royal blue, a uh, little bit of like silver trim on top of that as well to mix in with the silver or platinum jewelry that you see her wear. Um, but you see a small ear cuff that goes from her ear, has a little tiny dangling chain that goes from her ear up to the tip of her horn on the right hand side. And she comes down. Why, hello. It seems you have found me. Starts to. Uh, was I. Was I not supposed to? Oh, you most definitely were. I was hoping the invitation oh. would find you here. <laughs> it you did. Know, you do good at keeping a, a lady expecting. <laughs> I apologize. I was I came as quickly as I could. Oh, no worries, dear. The life of adventuring is um, is grandiose, and I have experienced that myself for a period of time. Is would you like something to drink, or how would I? Uh, how can I make your stay pleasant? Ah, uh, tea would be lovely. Absolutely. And she'll call out, Herschel, dear, would you mind getting me and uh, Mr. Weldo a pot of tea and a couple cups so we'll be out on the patio? Calling out from the other room, Yes, mistress. She goes and I, uh, I mean, no offense by this, but I would take your arm, but I'm, I feel like I'm a little tall for that. Oh. Can you repeat that last part? She goes, I do sincerely apologize. I would take your arm and lead you, but I feel like I'm a little bit tall for that. So I would just simply lead the way. Uh... <clears throat> I'm fine following behind you. Very well. And she goes ahead and starts leading you through. And you do see um, various statuary and uh, more tapestries. So definitely more of that ocean motif um, as she leads you back to a greenhouse. Um, seems to be on the back of the property attached to the house. Um, this is what she was referring to as the patio. Um, definitely a lot warmer inside than it is out. You do catch the smell of roses and various um, perfumes of flowers as she uh, takes you over to a little tiny gazebo that she has set up there, the small table, and goes and sits down. Uh, I will sit down across from her. So tell me. You said that you had various errands that you had to run, and I understand that. But tell me a little bit about your adventures. Where are you from? I feel that when last we met, there was a lot less talking involved for the one. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, that's not to say I didn't enjoy myself, but you, you're right about that. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't have invited you otherwise. <laughs> uh, well, 
Hmm, what's there to know? Uh, small little, small little town. Lots of, lots of little people. Lots of food, lots of fun. We're big on, uh, we're big on, uh, hedonism, I guess you'd say. Okay. Do you come from a halfling village? And what made you come yeah. out of that village? And wanting to see the the world in a different scale. Yeah, it that's pretty much what it was. Um I'd been there forever and I I wanted to know what everything else was like. And have you enjoyed the, the views that you have seen thus far? Um. Uh, yes. <laughs> I feel like that statement had to be run through a sensor like two or three times before you actually said yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Yes, well, that's absolutely wonderful, dear. That uh, that wanderlust, that wanting to go and see the world for what it is, and experiencing things new for the first time. I grew up here in Iman, um, though I've never, or not always here. And as she sang that, uh, the. The butler that she is called back over, the older halfling, um, starts to come in with the uh, the tea and the, the pots and stuff like that. She goes, I, uh, I enjoy where I am now. I have a chance to, to meet wonderful new people. I can help experience or help people experience things in the world um, or even be there to help out those that are in need. It's one of the reasons why I help Fyra's Overlook. They, although more civilized places like Iman and Whitestone, they are good for the varying peoples that live there. Some of the more mm -hmm. rich places are not as kind to my people. And it's simply superstition. You walk into, uh, you meet a person with horns and unnatural beauty. And the first thing that they're you jealous. think of is the hells. And mm. I'm sure a little bit of jealousy as well. <laughs> but that's where the Overlook helps with that helps people get set back mm. up. In fact, I've been trying to help out somebody myself, and I can't seem to actually find them. Oh? The, the night of the uh, Winter's Crest, and I think Lyra had mentioned uh, your warrior friends, the other tiefling, um, had brought in a child. Um, there was a couple of tieflings that had gone missing that night that were supposed to have made it to the party and didn't. And we don't know exactly what happened to them. I've been using my resources here to try to track them down, actually. Uh, well... Uh, <laughs> this is Zerelda Pricklebush at your service. Hmm. Oh, that's right. Pickle. <laughs> yes. Well, I would be more than happy to, if you and your companions would be happy to help, I would be able to give you what information I have. Um, I don't know what's all 
that what I've gathered so far isn't been much, but I'm waiting for a little bit more information coming tonight, actually, that might be of use. So they placed a couple feelers out with, um, let's say, some of my underground connections. Ah. Uh, they're supposed to be getting back to me with that. And I would rather, for poor use of a word, I would rather utilize adventurers that are um, known for plying their trade for the good compared to utilizing less savory members of it to try to track down what it is that we're looking for. Because yes, of course. If you're utilizing somebody less than savory, then you might not be getting exactly what it is that you're purchasing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. And at that point, she'll reach across and take your hand into hers. I do deeply appreciate any assistance you would be willing to to help out uh, a lovely tiefling noble such as myself. <laughs> and for this favor, I promise you the most exquisite dinner date that I could come up with. If that is okay with you, of course. That is very okay. Absolutely. Well, while we have our tea, would you like me to bring forth some of that um, the herbal remedies that we had the night of Winter's Crest? Oh, yes. That sounds delightful. Asha, will you go ahead and bring my hookah out, please? Yes, dear. With that, he goes and shuffles off into the manor again. And I think that that is where we are going to leave off for tonight. Okie dokie. So everybody, thank good. you for... I'm sorry, Swell. I was just going to say good seeing everybody. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's good seeing everybody. I hope that um, I, though I had to kind of do everything in parts, I know that that's kind of boring kind of sitting there, so I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the parts whenever I got to you. And next week we'll be going into a little bit more detail on uh, where some of these hooks might lead you. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you very much for those that have stuck around to watch us. Thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, we will be back here next week, same time. And as always, you guys are welcome at my table. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>